Hello there cellists. Here we are embarking on week 12, the final week of this series. And this has really been uh, presented initially to give something out to the cellists of mine who are shielding and to any cellists who've been shielding or have just been rather confined and could do with a bit of um, stimulation of their cello studies. Now you might wonder what I've chosen for this final week. I've chosen a movement from a sonata that is very dear to my heart uh, that I first came across um, and, and played and performed more than 35 years ago and I absolutely never tire of it and that's the Rachmaninoff cello sonata in G minor and we're going to be looking at the slow movement of this during the next four days. Um, this work was written in 1901 so it's only about 40 years after the Brahms E minor sonata that we were looking at last week. Um, and despite the fairly short t time frame between the two, a very, very different kind of writing. And obviously partly that's inherent in the, the composers and their own approaches and also, you know, where they've been brought up and what their musical education has been, as well as developments of, of instruments and stronger playing, louder playing, more thick textures. Um, as we all know, I think, you know, Rachmaninoff is known in a sort of a romantic way. And really, I suppose what we're talking about there is very rich harmonies with lots of uh, added inflections and augmentations. Not only that, but actually, you know, he had a very wide hand span um, and, and you get enormous intervals, which are really quite challenging to um, uh, um, anyone with a, an ordinary hand span. So you'll see an awful lot of tense and beyond in the writing. Um, this richness means that actually in this particular sonata, I mean, the piano part is so full of detailed texture and harmony um, and, you know, use of sustained pedal has to be a bit careful, I think. All the cellist may not be heard through it. Um, however, you know, with careful work with your pianist, you absolutely can make this a balanced performance. So more of that later. Um, the other thing we are going to be looking at this week is Foyard study number 47. And I've chosen this in part because it's full of triplets and uh, the Rachmaninoff keeps on diversifying off into triplets. Um, and it's also, there's a little bit of a sort of sense of enharmonic writing in the study so that our minds need to get used to thinking D flat or C sharp and switching between the two. Um, slightly different usage in Rachmaninoff, but nevertheless, this is not a bad idea for getting our minds around that enharmonic change, if you like. Um, and I suppose there's also this sort of sense of uh, making really lovely long legato lines that are drawn through the triplets in the study, which would probably help your playing um, in the Rachmaninoff, where you may be changing your bow more and articulating more within the triplet, but we still need to have that flowing line. So we will begin on that shortly. Uh, let me just jump my spikes secure, that's better. Um, however, let's start thinking about uh, warm-ups. Now, although the sonata is in G minor, this third movement is actually an E flat major. Um, so I think an E flat major scale would be a good idea just for a warming up point of view, but maybe to make it a little bit more interesting and give yourself a challenge, you could change the way you, give, you divide the timing. So we nearly always either play even notes or long tonics, uh, i.e. the keynote being longer. But let's try something else. Let's take advantage of the fact that there are seven notes in the octave before we get to the eighth repeating the tonic. And we can use that to have a triplet and then quadruplet um, division of the beats. The pulse will be the same. <clears throat> so we're not talking about an even division of three and four notes with the sound being even, but to divide the same speed of bow, uh, consequently the triplet will be slower. Okay, so let's just try it out. A, a triplet followed by four, so we would have... <laughs> Well, where you do um, four first and a triplet afterwards. 
if you find it difficult to imagine those, you can always assign a word to them so that you could have um, a butterfly for the triplet and caterpillar for the quadruplet. Um, and you can always, of course, have the caterpillar vest, which might be more appropriate. So there's a food for thought, you know, give it a try. Now thinking about muddling things up, we can do something similar with arpeggios, which I think I've probably mentioned before, that rather than standardly separating them in threes, which fall in line with the pattern that you hear and feel, bow them in fours. Now this time I'm talking about even notes, so something like if we took E flat minor for change, okay? <laughs> changing the bow on four you're actually moving over the shift point uh, so that's definitely worth a try and something a bit different um, I chose E flat minor because Rachmaninoff teases us rather with is it major is it minor <laughs> um, <coughs> in that in this movement that we'll be looking at he doesn't use a G flat though he uses an F sharp so there's a bit of a question mark there um, food for thought now the other thing I think would be really useful would be to take, say, E flat major arpeggio and add in a configuration. So all the time we're looking at things that you probably are familiar with, you might even be a little bored of them. Uh, so let's try and make them a bit more interesting. So rather than just, you know, standardly, you know, up and down your arpeggio, just let's think about the notes in a different order and maybe therefore really have to think about what you are playing not necessarily in the fingering of the arpeggio what do i mean i'm actually going to start um, a fifth above and i'm going to keep dropping down every other note like this <laughs> I started with B flat and I went to E flat. Then I went up to the next note, have the E flat and went down to G, etc. So the pattern repeats. And luckily enough, I have written it out on a bit of manuscript. So here's a point you can do a freeze frame of the video just to have a look at what I mean by that. And of course, if you're already familiar with this Rachmaninoff, you'll know why I've chosen that configuration. And that is, of course, that it does include the um, this falling fifth shift on a slur and I'm purposefully wanting to go back on the full length of the D string there so that's something you can try out of the context of the composition you'll be looking at and therefore you can really sort of also get an agile mind about the notes that you're playing uh, and changing the order to our standard right now let's move on a little look at the Foyard, um, number 47. We'll just do the first four bars of this. This is actually in the key of C minor and starts off being very straightforwardly in that key and because we've got um, you know sets of six notes at a time which is sort of implying a harmony this is an opportunity for you to think about what is the chord it's implying. Okay so the first bar <laughs> just purely C minor and within there we've got an inarticulate shift on the way down little finger to little finger and it's a falling fifth oh no it's not it's a fifth altogether but on the way down it's going to a third then the second bar what is this it's a diminished seventh that was hiding in there somewhere it's all ornamented, you know, with an odd passing note and um, uh, little oscillations to the, the neighbouring note. And then we're back to something similar. The opening, we think, yeah, C minor, then. Ooh. 
So he's augmenting the interval there and we're going up to an A flat, which is now implying an A flat major. So from C minor, we're going to an A flat major sound. La la. If we took the A flat major to be a dominant, are we expecting D flat solution? Yes, we are. There it is, straight away from C minor. Pretty nifty, isn't it, to get to D flat major implication. And then halfway through bar four. So again, we've got the augmentation. At the same time, from this note, it's no longer a D flat, actually. It's a C sharp in the writing. And your mind may think... It may be thinking A major, but I don't think that's what's implied here. I think it's actually implied that we're already arriving at F sharp minor, which is where he's heading off to. Um, that's where I think it is going. Obviously it's only a line, there is no harmony underneath, and of course you could choose to imagine it differently. That's my feeling, I think we've already arrived at a second inversion of F sharp minor. So that's all it is, and of course in the uh, playing of it, other than we're trying to think, do we understand something of the implied harmonies, and, and make sure we've got agility in the shifts, and um, really smooth bow work, I suppose, you know. <laughs> see if you can encourage your fingers and ear to sort of feel a journey and uh, that's the sample we've got now we move on to the Rachmaninoff slow movement and the cellist has a lovely long eight bar rest at the opening where you can really immerse yourself into the fantastic rich harmonic colour that Rachmaninoff brings in this composition um, and this very first bar is where we immediately get a question mark because I said to you it's an E flat major and yet at the opening what you hear is sounds like E flat minor. It is really fascinating because he actually writes that on that very first note, the first beat, you've got an F sharp and an E flat together at the same moment in time. And orally, you know, it does sound like E flat minor, but it is interesting that he hasn't chosen to write it as a G flat. And then halfway through the bar, we get the G natural. So, I mean, it may possibly have just been for the convenience of not having to put flats and naturals forth, back and forth. It may also actually be hinting at the fact that the whole sonata is in G minor and F sharp is the leading note and G is the, the key of the entire work. Yeah, maybe something in that. So there we have this sort of already this question mark in the very first bar. It's not settled um, and and then continues through with some lovely sort of four, three suspensions over E flat, um, which keep occurring in bars two and bars four. Um, there is a rise. We, we do touch on G minor in bar six. All this is just beautiful things you can just sit back and really enjoy listening to. Um, uh, there's a sort of possible A flat minor out of ninth, um, moves to E flat, you know there's so much richness going on here and then finally you, know, you can hear a beautiful rise in the piano melodic line and it's just about really really clear absolutely with the breathing that we're about to arrive and begin and we have the melody that the piano has introduced at the very start but it is really interesting because even in our very first bar of entry harmonically he switches it round. So the opening had this implicit E flat minor, E flat major. We enter C flat major from E flat minor. So quite interesting, isn't it? It's almost like we'll be really positive at the beginning, but actually we're not so sure. Maybe it's quite minor. It's also marked at forte and on the D string. And where are we leading to? There's an awful lot of B flats here. There aren't many notes in those first two bars, and it's really important that you get good shaping. So I think we're moving into the middle of the bar. 
Don't lose the line. <laughs> That's the really most important thing. Although we're shaping, we're moving through those quavers to the dotted crotchet. The fall <laughs> needs to be as clean as you can. Now we have covered a lot of um, these sorts of shifts, articulate shifts over big distances. And we know the left hand needs to move quite quickly. If you keep your elbow a little bit on the higher side, it will certainly help you get back there quick enough so that you're not pushing against the elbow. Um, musically though, having gone to the E flat, which is the, the uh, keynote of this movement, we're straight back to the B flat and it's got a line on it. And we're really settled and we really hold through to the end of the bar. Now at this point you need to be aware, all the time actually, you need to be aware of what's happening in the piano part and they are now going to be dovetailing us with a beautiful sort of canonic entry so after we play this, they begin, they begin the, what we've just played. So be sure that the interlocking is right. So as you've played, do you see what I mean? So it's going to be following in your footsteps, a lovely, lovely shadow and echoing kind of going on in there. Um, so it's really important to get this precision right at the start that you are placing your note correctly. We then go on the second um, phrase of this. And it's a little bit more indulgent. It's going to rise above that B flat um, to give a bit of embellishment. to sort of try to like hold the line myself and not speak and interrupt myself because throughout this it's absolutely about joining it all up and drawing that line through to its very final endpoint um, which I hope you could get some sort of feeling of that. You notice also the use of going up the D string it's a fantastic uh, sort of sonorous rich but somehow sort of um, under the cover kind of register and tonal qualities in that, quite different to the, you know, the A string sound for those same notes, it's just not as um, wide a sound or something, you know, it's not as rich. So super richness here, which you'll be really working um, very hard over uh, because of course there's an awful lot going on in the piano. Um, now this bar, at the end of this phrase, your first sentence there, it's a really important point not only because it's the peak, but also this is the bar in which Rachmaninoff now introduces the triplets. So up until this point, the piano has semiquavers running all the way through. Everything's very clearly duplet. Um, and then halfway through the bar um, at this um, pinnacle point, triplets begin halfway through your minimum E flat there. Um, and there's a writ, and you must fit your quavers, your duplet quavers, beautifully in the middle of the triplet, which is going to be a slow writting triplet, and that your second quaver will then fit with a right hand piano upbeat into the next melodic phrase. So this is a really important point in terms of the ensemble. Um, it looks very, very straightforward the notes point of view but you just absolutely need to be on top of the feeling of it one two can I do one two three one two three that's, that's quite hard to talk and speak <laughs> uh, so much easier with real notes so there's our opening phrase really long held together don't lose sight of where you're drawing to and be very careful as you come back down the phrase as it kind of 
closes away from that apparent optimism or emotional um, intensity. Now this next portion, um, again, there's a long period that the piano is introducing the next melodic line, which is full of triplets. Da, 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 dee, da, dee, da, da. So it's a lot of going triplet, duplet, essentially um, on the triplet line, but um, uh, every couple of bars, they're, they're in semiquavers are brought into the left hand of the piano, so it gives a sense of something a bit urgent, something is occurring here, you know, it's actually bringing up the sort of emotional temperature, if you like, before the point at which we come in, um, uh, which is, again, where there are these semiquavers. Um, and we're now coming in a sort of mezzo forte, so fairly kind of certain of itself. <laughs> just passed is another point where we go da 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 di da da where we get a four and a three in the second half of the bar again this feeling of Im something impetuous something bubbling under the surface now if you just took that cello line yourself it's a beautiful melody but maybe you wouldn't realize how therefore it's going to be quite important that the the a flat you need to keep an intense vibrato going on that because that is actually then coloring what is happening in the texture underneath you or around you indeed um, and that this phrase has got a long way to go and it's going to go up and up and up and you need to sort of like keep your um, pace yourself I suppose is the right answer so we've got to this fairly intense sounding A flat <laughs> This tied crotchet where we've got pa da 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 di da da in the piano. Again, this sort of sense of drama. But we're going up and down. Don't forget the hairpins that are going up and down overall. We're going to step up, step up, step up. But you do need to be able to sort of come away from where you've arrived to give yourself a little bit more room. So we've arrived here. <laughs> is actually a beginning you know it's a pivotal turning point where drama is occurring and it's quite a different from melodic color uh, harmonic color uh, I'm not going beyond this point in this this particular class and um, this is the stopping point for this session um, but let's just have a momentary look at what we've had coming up there so the whole thing builds up to the E flat um, do I don't have a bar number there let me see if I can grab one for you um, da, 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 D, 29. <laughs> okay, so we have. Now it's really important here, during the E flat, you will hear quite clearly the crotchet um, melodic counterline going on in the piano. Uh, again, being very careful that we get the placements right. It's a wonderful how if the harmony sings chromatically down to this sort of, um, I think, is it B-flat minor at this point? Um, mm, no, I think it's like, it's just it's still sitting on the E-flat, but with a seven, added seventh. Absolutely gorgeous, rich harmonies. Personally, I quite like at the tapering end of this bar, because we're fortissimo here. Those two final quavers of the bar are indicated with a diminuendo, but keep the warmth, not, you know, don't fade away too much, holding. Going to this A flat. Now you'll notice that some of these, these triplets are marked with marcato lines. Um, um, where else do we have them? I don't think they're too much separation. It's it's almost that you don't actually leave the string, but you da 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 are going within pressure points that we are creating those fractional marcato lines. 
um, and we've seen a few of them on en route here. Uh, slightly different in the duplets in um, bar 28. Possibly a little bit more between those, but there are longer notes so that it kind of makes sense there. So in terms of this sort of build up from the, the second phrase, let's just see how it builds all together then. <laughs> question mark oh because we are going off on an amazing journey any moment now a couple of places where I didn't quite keep my uh, bow control there um, but you get the general idea about the sort of rise and fall and the drama uh, but don't let go of the intensity in the slightly longer notes you know where you get this um, uh, dotted crotchets and there's our initial introduction um, one other little techie point there, just thinking about the very end, we're at the point of the bow. In order to keep that hell's kind of intense feeling, which I'm talking about because it's really about to go on to an amazing, very rich harmonic journey instantly, um, keep a flat bow hair at the point here. And that will stand you in good stead. Give the vibrato to match with it so that we know it's not really, it's not a... And I've finished. <laughs> it absolutely isn't, it's totally. And I certainly haven't finished and you wait. <laughs> okay, so I hope you, you are um, uh, finding something in this to kind of make you open up your rack mouth and go, go and try this out. See you tomorrow.